So, Dr. Vishal, all ready? Yes, sir. Your, your voice is uh, echoing. My voice is echoing. Why? There, is, there must be some some gadget which must be you know, inter, <coughs> interf interfering. Are, are you on two gadgets simultaneously? No, no, sir. Only one. Still, my voice is no. echoing. No, now it's fine. Now it's fine. Yeah. Okay. My phone was near the <laughs> yeah. Maybe, next stop. <coughs> that may be the reason. Okay, we'll start, right? Yes. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to this evening episode of Pursue. And we have Pursue 1L, which is Europathology. And we are streaming live from BIA Cancer Center Hyderabad via Kolkata. And we have a very special person today. And speaking on a very special topic, and the topic is very nicely worded by him. The topic goes as, hello, Gio, what's happening? Grossing to reporting, which is the part one, which is kidney and prostate, and handled with care, of course. And to talk on that, we have none other than Dr. B. Vishal Rao, who's a postgraduate in pathology and DNB pathology, DRC path from London, UK, postdoctoral fellowship in oncopathology from Tata Medical Center, Kolkata, Observership as a postdoctoral fellow from John Hopkins Hospital, Baltimore, USA. He's, a, he's presently as a senior consultant pathologist in Basavata Rakam Indo American Cancer Hospital and Research Institute, Hyderabad, a very famous institute, and I have had the honor of visiting that. And he is also, he has a special feather on the cap as he's a visiting fellow scientist as an IRC editor for the upcoming WHO classification of urinary systems and male genital organs in its fifth edition. So who better than him to talk on GU and to talk to us on various aspects of GU, right from grousing to reporting. Before I ask Dr. Rao to take over, let me request all of you to please keep your mic muted, your camera off, and please don't share your screen. With this, let me request Dr. Vishal Rao, sir, please share your screen and start. The stage is all yours. Can you see my screen? Yes, sir. your screen is absolutely yeah. clearly visible and your voice is very, very clearly audible. Please start, sir. Thank you. Yes. Good evening to all. Good evening, uh, Dr. Nadeem. And uh, I thank Dr. Nadeem and Dr. Divya, madam, to give me for giving me this opportunity for uh, presenting this, uh, uh, this presentation. And uh, <clears throat> my presentation, uh, this is part one. Uh, which in which I will be including grossing to reporting of uh, kidney and prostate and part two in later part I will be discussing uh, blad urinary bladder testis and uh, penile cancers so uh, why I have chosen this topic is that day to day uh, in our uh, practice pathology practice uh, we face a lot of problems and uh, the PG students who join us uh, as freshers and they and the seniors also how to gross the specimen because always I tell my PGTs that grossing is the most important uh, station because if you do the grossing properly your reporting becomes very easy so with this uh, no, notion in our mind 
let's move ahead so first i will take kidney uh, i am not saying as a update because uh, i am working with the who uh, this year and uh, the update is will be coming uh, at the end of this year when we will see a new uh, who book so this is just a review and what uh, what we have been doing all these years in uh, grossing of the geo samples so first we will take kidney so uh, renal cell carcinomas as you see the history that earlier it was nine entities and before that it was just granular cell and non granular cells and later in uh, 2015 the last update we saw an emerging so many uh, 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 many terminologies and many cancers and now we have to see in 2021 how many uh, new entities have been added definitely this is the uh, the last uh, update of the kidney tumors this, this is the list of those 50 tumors so many tumors uh, uh, will be changed and many tumors will be added we will be will be see, seeing in the later part of this year of 2021 so just uh, before going into the grossing we should know what are the changes which was made so that accordingly we can do the grossing so first were the changes were <coughs> identified as tumor morphology so depending upon the morphology many changes have occurred and uh, addition of sarcomatoid and rhabdoid differentiation was added the percentage has, you have to mention because it directly uh, it directly affect the prognosis of the tumor the tumor necrosis here also you have to uh, write the percentage of tumor necrosis and you should you should you have to uh, gross tentatively uh, because if you gross the entire necrotic area, you will end up saying that 100% of the tumor is necrosis. So you have to take different uh, um, uh, grossing from different areas. Then according to, and then grading, major change was there. The the time test is for, uh, tested, a uh, Furman grade was replaced by the ICEP, uh, by the ICEP and WHO uh, also approved it. So it is called as a WHO ICEP. It is just not the ICEP, just not WHO, but both we have to include and microvascular invasion as a potential prognostic marker. These were the main changes which occurred in the last WHO. So we will see how to gross the specimen, final report or how to report it and what is the clinical significance of this. So what are the before grossing you should know the relevant clinical history. Like what are the clinical risks, whether it is an upfront case or it is a cytoreductive surgery and other radiological details like size, site, extent of the disease. Then accordingly you, you will cut the specimen and see okay where is the extension. Accordingly you will gross the specimen. Also prior diagnosis in our centers we are very lucky that we get very sm we have small biopsies because they are required for tumor diagnosis. So if there is a already diagnosis done and ISC has already attempted on small biopsies no need to do unnecessary ISC on the larger specimen and prior treatment also is very important when there is a um, extensive T4 tumor uh, chemotherapy has been given so there may be many chemotherapy induced changed and sometimes you will not see a tumor at all so that is why prior treatment is also required and but this is the most important point that is communication with the surgeon or the treating clinician is very important in case of any discrepancy. So the type of specimen which we receive and usually you may also receive are the renal core biopsies, the partial nephrectomies which are which we receive are robotic either robotic or laparoscopic or open surgeries and uh, radical ne nephrectomies which can be upfront case when the size is less and depending upon the clinical features it can be a cytoreductive surgery but just they have to uh, reduce the tumor burden or it it can be a post chemo where their size has been shrunken by the chemotherapy and then the surgery has been done. So first we will see the renal core biopsy. So uh, core biopsy basically it is done uh, in uh, to find out whether it is a reactive condition or a, uh, or a neoplasm. We are many a times we see patient presenting as a vague mass or mass or lump in the kidney and uh, to assess the nature of the lesion many times uh, the clinician does the biopsies. We have also seen this cases xanthogranulomatous pyelonephritis presenting as a vague lump, interstitial nephritis due to infection and melocoplakia uh, not even in kidney in other cases also we have seen as a in colon also in bladder also where they present as a mass and uh, they just mimic uh, any malignancy and if there is a malignancy uh, further can we subtype it subtype type it or not 
and whether to find out whether it is a metastasis or any non epithelial neoplasm so what are the practical problems which we face in core biopsy when we get basically what i face is where a mixed morphology when i see both ts and morphology and papillary pattern so is it a clear cell rcc or is a papillary rcc then oncocytic nearly all the most of the tumors in our renal cell tumors if you see renal cell carcinoma they have they show eosinophilic cytoplasm so this is a very very uh, important problem and the high grade high grade tumors also uh, where they have bizarre nuclei and we don't know they don't uh, show any morphological uh, specific morphological feature of any uh, definite rcc then it is a problem so if you can see uh, on the left side you can see uh, the tumors all are showing uh, eosinophilic cytoplasm but when you try to do isc like amcar was positive uh, it was a uh, the first one is the uh, papillary renal cell carcinoma where amcar is positive then the second is a uh, uh, cd10 is very diffusely positive showing a tear cell rcc then this is an oncocytoma which is supported by focal positivity of CK7 and a chromophore with a distinct cell membrane was showing a diffuse positivity of CK7. So the, those were the problem for the renal biopsies. So most of the time we were able to solve the problem. So but, but again, the when in a biopsy, uh, I told that it is an oncocytic uh, neoplasm. But when I spoke with the clinician, clinician showed that the tumor is very big and it is infiltrating into the renal vein. It could not be an oncocytoma. I kindly review it. So then we did ISC. and we found that it wasn't it wasn't an oncocytoma but it was a type 2 papillary carcinoma so that is why uh, whenever there is a discrepancy better to talk with the clinician and then work accordingly now coming to the partial nephrectomy so partial nephrectomy when uh, you, uh, the surgeon do partial nephrectomy when there is the tumor size is less than or equal to 4 cm but uh, in our center i have seen a little bit bigger tumors also if they are where that they are polar tumors which are hanging outside they they if even if they are more than 4 cm they can do it and uh, usually done for a benign oncocytoma or angiomyelopoma which we have been uh, biopsied or looks like <coughs> grossly so where, how to process this sample so partial nephrectomy how to process this sample so you any specimen same rule you have to weigh and uh, rec- rec- for the dimension all the three dimension you have to mention mention you always look for uh, external surface because whether uh, whether it is smooth or if the tumor is infiltrating or it, is there any tumor deposits on that also inking the raw surface because in a in a uh, partial nephrectomy so mostly done for polar tumors so there will be other at the upper pole or at the lower pole even if it is a interpolar tumor then you will have a raw surface as one side and the other surface will be covered with fat so whatever the raw surface is you see as soon as you see the raw surface in that raw surface in a little bit uh, let it let it get dry so both and cut section uh, and then along the raw surface you cut the uh, specimen and uh, usually uh, we get partial nephrectomies for in uh, Uh, frozen sections because they, the surgeon wants to know that whether he has got a, a clear margin or not and fixation is also done later if frozen section is not there then you have to cut around the uh, raw surface and keep it for fixation in 1 is to 10 ratio in nbf so this is the specimen of uh, partial nephrectomy this is what i was talking about see the raw surface is there and the other surface is it is a interpol and this is a polar uh, Uh, upper pole tumor and uh, see the upper pole the perinephric fat and gerota fascia will be there and uh, this is the raw surface which you have to ink better to ink with black color and then after that you cut perpendicularly so uh, so after cut section you can see this is the this is the ink surface this is the capsule this is the tube so definitely when you are doing a frozen section you you have to give and make sure that you give a good section because uh, in frozen section if you get give a haphazard section cutting may be a problem so what are the key to sections so this uh, i request all the pgts to this is the very important slide for all the sections key to sections we have to give so what are the key to sections tumor with capsule and parenchymal resection margin two to three sections we have to give non necrotic if necro usually it is not necrotic only in partial nephrectomies and tumor with adjacent kidney one section and perinephric fat and gerota fascia these are the sections you have to give not more than five sections are required in partial nephrectomies 
So the tumor with the, so this you can see tumor with capsule and the native kidney, and you can see clearly clear more clear cell morphology is there. So this is how you record your findings. You are always mentioned the uh, mentioned the clinical history or uh, specimen. Always mentioned first the laterality, the specimen again the laterality and the 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 whatever procedure has been done, uh, partial nephrectomy or radical nephrectomy. So this is the exact because this is a very important information, medical legal information required maybe later. So you should always tell the laterality in any organ and in this also. The gross findings also you have to record what is a, how you have received the specimen, what is the measurement of the specimen. Then after cut section you found the tumor, what is the size of the tumor and how far is the resected margin and you have given representative for the same. So this is how you record a gross finding. Then you, after seeing the slides you can record your microscopic findings. Uh, I request all the PGTs to be very specific. Don't write lengthy, lengthy half of pages uh, descriptions. Your main aim should be like how you see in the microscope in a scanner view. You just tell what is the morphology, how the tumor morphology is, whether they are in sheets, whether they are their nests, or how they are, and then the individual tumor cells, how they are looking. So this is the final impression which we uh, which which we give. Then again, same laterality and the specimen and the organ. Then you have to write clear cell, uh, renal cell, and you have to give the grape. Uh, I said WHO, I said grape. The, in uh, partial nephrectomy, what are the important uh, points to be written is uh, the size, LVI, any, any uh, abnormal features are there and this renal capsular and parenchymal margins are free of tumor. This is the main point which is the surgeon is also looking and perinephric fat general fissure if they are present you have to mention. So whenever, uh, always I tell whenever you are reporting a pa the pa partial specimen or a radical specimen always report like a clinician because you because this is mainly for the staging of the tumors so always uh, first this report which be read by the surgeon so he will be uh, concerned about the size and the margins then again it will go to the medical oncologist then they will also see what are the other features what is the morphology what is the size what is LVI is there or not and how are the margins and then radiotherapy people also if possible they can they will also see the report so uh, after partial nephrectomy, let's see the radical specimen, how to do the grossing for radical specimen. Same radical specimen, if we see that we receive kidney, uh, ureter, most of it, uh, renal vein, artery, perinephric fat, surrounding gerotus fascia and adrenal gland can be present. Again, processing of the sample will be same, weigh the specimen, dimension, external surface you have to see and uh, cut section, again localization, size and extension of the tumor you have to see. And proper fixation is very important in this all, in all the specimens. You have to fix in 1 is to 10 ratio. And try to, whenever from the OT you see, as when you receive the specimen, the, the jars may be not uh, appropriate for. So better when you received a fresh, fresh specimen or specimen in a jar with formalin, try to change a fresh formalin, formalin and after fixation, after cutting, and keep it in a bigger jar according to the specimen so that 1 is to 10 ratio of formalin fixation is maintained. So these are the specimen which we receive you can see so when you cut it when you, uh, better to cut it first in the ha half along the hilum and then you can uh, serially slice the tumor for, so that the better fixation is there. And again, uh, on cut section, you have to uh, mention what you are seeing. Any scarring is there? What is the what is the color of the tumor? And what is there any necrosis is there? And what is the extension? Can you say is can you uh, if you identify if it is uh, going into the perinephric fat or renal sinus fat? So these are the factors which you, which you should look. So this is the so again this is the most important slide. I want your attention on this slide. If you <clears throat> if you are not paying attention to the other slides but this is the most important slide for the kidney one because here we have we are seeing that we have cut open the kidney you can definitely you can see there is a one uh, tumor uh, the white tumor is there and then what are the sections you will give in this so tumors so I always tell uh, my if you are sometimes some people will give tumor section differently and then you they will give 
genitals, fascia, perine, free fat. Don't give like that. If you give a section from here, you will get the genitals, fascia, perine, free fat and the tumor in one section. So basically from different, different, you, you have flaps of different, uh, uh, different, different flaps. You can give from different places. Like from one flap, you can give here. The second flap, you can give from here. And third flap, you can give from here. So definitely the tumor is going into the perine, free fat. So if you ink the, uh, you ink the surface, so genitals, fascia involvement is there or not, we will know. So definitely this will be there. Then, so ideally, ideal uh, tumor sections in any uh, radical specimen, they say three to four sections from non-necrotic area. Definitely you don't, uh, you have to sample uh, necrotic areas, but for the tumor uh, assessment, three to four sections from the non-necrotic areas have to give it. Second, uh, other sections, what you have to give is the tumor with renal sinus fat, tumor with hilum, and tumor with adjacent kidney. One and two, two sections can be given. And renal artery, vein, and ureteral cut margins have to given have to be given separately. And again, lymph nodes. If adrenal is present, you can just give adrenal. You know, and if lymph nodes are there accordingly, and also try to look for uh, lymph nodes in the perihilal perihilal area and the in the perinephric fat. So this is the these are the key to section for radical specimen. So tumor with capsule, perinephric fat, and genitals fascia. Uh, we have to give three to four sections uh, from the non necrotic uh, areas. Tumor with renal sinus fat, tumor with hilum and renal pelvis. Tumor with adjacent kidney, renal artery and vein margins, ureter cut margin, uh, normal adjacent kidney, and representative section of the adrenal. So this is how we uh, try to record our fi findings. Again, same clinical histories. Specimen again, as I told you, laterality, the specimen, and then again laterality, the what are, what is the. Uh, Spare the surgery done in this case. Uh, there was the, it was an extensive tumor which was uh, adherent uh, with the colon also, uh, which was uh, uh, infiltrating the cirrhosal surface of ascending colon also, and IVC thrombus was also there. So again, you 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 saw that you have to uh, record all the findings. What is the size of the kidney, ureter, adrenal, genitals, fascia, number of tumors, and dimension of the tumors. What is the site? Description in invasion, how it, where it is invading, how far is the ureter, ureter, how much is the length and where, how far it is, and any other findings which are there, you have to tell. So if you see uh, microscopy, you can, most of the time it is very, uh, uh, most of the time it is uh, it, the common tumors you see clear cell RCC where you see the uh, clear cytoplasm, papillary RCCs, uh, AML also we, we saw not many cases but uh, angiomyelipoma cases are also there. Chromophobe where distinct cell membranes uh, is there we are also seen. So this is how you uh, report your, give your final impression after seeing the morphology. What is the type of tumor? What is our WHO ICEP grade? What is the location, size, extension? If it is limited to kidney, is it not invading the renal sinus fat? You write limited to kidney. And then LVI is there, necrosis is there, sarcomotor differentiation, how much percentage you have to give, and other findings which we you had margins, and, uh, and uh, if uh, any other uh, uh, findings are there, you have to record. And again, then IVC was also sent in this case, patient in a separate uh, container. So sarcomotoid and rhabdoid differentiation are very important because they they. Uh, they tell the prognosis of the patient. So, sarcomotoid can uh, with a uh, with vascular malignant spindle cells. Right, the rhabdoid uh, cells are also seen in uh, chromo in association with chromophobe RCC, and uh, they are basically large epithelioid cells with uh, you can see uh, central eosinophilic. Uh, uh, this uh, intracytoplasmic inclusions are there. Tumor necrosis is also very important and. Uh, Mm, you have to give the percentage and as I told you, you have to be a uh, little, uh, you have to identify the t t different tumors areas. If you try to give more, more from the, uh, from one area only, then you end up uh, giving uh, maximum necrotic areas only rather than the tumor itself. So grading of the tumors, 
uh, as you see that uh, now Furman grade is not used, the WHO ISAP nuclear grading is uh, seen and uh, more or less I found it is very same, similar and uh, grade 1 and 2, 3, 4 grades, grades are there and more or less it looks same, uh, 1, 2, 3 depends upon the presence of nuclei at different uh, uh, magnifications and uh, grade 4 is again uh, bizarre cells and uh, sarcomatoid differentiation is there. And uh, this is an important point that chromophobe RCC, it has to be not to be graded. So, uh, when you are writing chromophobe RCC, that's it, don't grade it. So, we have seen how to gross it, how to report it, but what is the problem now? So, practical problem which I am facing is, again, morphological cocktails still exist in larger specimen also. High grade tumor, we don't know how where to put them. And breaking the IC codes, if you see, if again you can see these are the uh, these are the sections from the radical specimen again same morphology and eosinophilic characters and they may look very uh, features may look very benign or but uh, the outcomes they may look same but the outcomes are totally different both are cats but uh, result is totally different even grading also some may say it is three some may say it is four so there may be a discrepancy between. Uh, subjectivity can be there among pathologists. So, and if you see, uh, you want to try uh, to solve this problem uh, with ISC, you can see so many ISCs are there. So, how to go about it? How to break this matrix of ISC? So, in, you see papillary carcinoma CK7 is positive, you are very happy. And then uh, you do the panel and you see CD10 is also positive and you said, what? And then oncocytoma CD117 is positive, CK7 is occasionally positive. These cells may be positive in the scar areas. So uh, with this problem, seeing these problems, uh, uh, what I try to do is uh, I try to make a concise panel which is uh, helpful, which is very concise and which is uh, cost effective, which can be used in all the patients. So if you see this, this um, panel of four markers, we, we used and uh, we uh, found uh, to correct almost 98 to 99 percent of the uh, cases, solve those cases. We did a proper study and we published this uh, uh, in urology annals and uh, uh, it was published uh, last year. So with, uh, with these uh, things in mind, so we have seen the grossing uh, the reporting and what problems we are facing and how we can overcome the uh, ISC. So, uh, so uh, I'll share uh, two cases, two three cases of rare and interesting cases in our from our department. So this, this case one is a 37 year female with uh, left renal mass and uh, she had a vague uh, palpating mass, uh, vague, vague mass. So this was the. Uh, when we received the gross specimen and uh, very brown, mahogany brown, you can say that color is a very well circumscribed but very big tumor. So this was the morphology, it was looking very benign and uh, but the size was very huge and uh, all the cells were showing uh, isnophilic uh, cytoplasm with uh, round to oval nuclei. CD117 was uh, very much uh, positive in this case. Uh, surprisingly, some areas CK7 was also positive. So, other IC which we did uh, showed negativity for CD10, Amcar, and Mimentin. And cycling D1 also was very focal positive. So, when we checked into the latest WHO uh, guidelines, so it was a renal cell carcinoma unclassified oncocytic low grade type. So, we searched uh, for the uh, we, we searched for the references. So it was an unclassified. It basically, it is not a distinct type of RCC, but a diagnostic criteria for tumor that really do not fit into any recognized subtypes. And uh, it can be low grade and high grade. And uh, these tumors uh, accounts for less than five percent of RCCs in reported series. And uh, a patient range from 21 to 91 per years and about 50% of the reported cases occurred in men and mortality, however the mortality rate is higher than the routine clear cell RCCs. 
and uh, usually large they are usually large and involve uh, extensively involve the kidney like in our case and uh, have a di- more than 50% cases have diameter more than 7 cm and uh, feature does not resemble those uh, any uh, well characterized uh, characterized uh, rcc and uh, so tumor that may be included in this criteria are uh, combination of features are there of more than one recognized subtype or unrecognized epithelial cells, lower high grade unclassified oncocytic neoplasm, other unclassified tumors. The genetic profile is limited because they are very rare cases and these tumors tend to have marked genetic instability. So prognosis, uh, as we saw that it's not good and uh, again, uh, high grade features have a bad prognosis. So second case, uh, it's a 49 year old male presented with abdominal lump and pain since two months of duration and we found a large abdominal mass on the left side crossing midline. So this was a, this was a tumor which recently we got uh, one uh, two months back and these, uh, these you can see a large tumor and replacing the entire kidney and different different areas are there and these uh, glistening grey white areas are also there. So when we saw the uh, HNE you can see uh, definitely the epithelial cells are there which have distinct cell membrane and uh, isnophilic cytoplasm, few have clear cytoplasm and we saw bone also and uh, we saw uh, this uh, atypical cells which were more of spindle yeah, like this, you know, spindle cells and uh, which was haphazardly uh, arranged and uh, this spindle cell component was like 70 to 80% as compared to the epithelial component. This is the epithelial component. This is the uh, bizarre component, cell component. So when we for the we, uh, for the uh, spindle cell component, we did SMA, which was positive. We did Cal Desmond, which was beautiful, positive. This is the I think very few cases I have seen this much positivity for Cal Desmond. CK7 was also very much uh, positive in this case, and CD117. So if we see the um, ICs which we I used uh, my panel of CK7, CD117, and MK along with the spindle cell uh, because of the morphology. So uh, we made a diagnosis of chromophobe RCC uh, with predominant leomyosarcoma component of 80% with osteosarcoma and chondromatous uh, differentiation was also there. And at the time of diagnosis, the patient also had lung metastasis. So again, uh, uh, we thought that it, because the, more, the percentage of sarcoma is more, so we labeled this as sarcomatoid pomophobe RCC. But uh, according to the expert, uh, experts, when I discussed this case, we and uh, WHO when we referred, so basically whatever the percentage you have to, percentage of the sarcomatoid percentage, you have to write as a component only. You have to write the epithelial component as a primary tumor. So in this, then we change our diagnosis to chromophobe RCC with pre- predominant leomyosarcoma component 80% with uh, osteosarcomatous and chondrosarcomatous differentiation. And a uh, little bit of literature for this, about 35 cases of uh, this uh, uh, sarcomatoid RCC was with uh, heterologous elements have been described. So far 12 cases with sarcomatoid chromophobe uh, containing heterologous elements have been reported. And uh, did so for this include a classic sarcoma, sarcomatous urothelial components, his spindle cell component is predominant. And additional primary sarcoma should not contain epithelial component. Uh, the patient currently is on uh, TKI, sunitinib, and uh, seven week co- follow up is there, which is un- uneventful. So, unclassified RCCs and sarcomatoids are aggressive and present with rapid uh, di- uh, disease uh, progression and poor pro- prognosis. And awareness, agreement, aggression, aggressive treatment strategies, and close surveillance are required while evaluating the patient in multi uh, disciplinary team meetings. Uh, the last case is, uh, is a 37 year female uh, we came with a complaint of decreased appetite and distension of abdomen since 20 days she when uh, she was evaluated uh, in our hospital she it was found that she had a very big large tumor of 19 centimeter and uh, in the l- right lumbar and right iliac fossa with mass effect was there loss of flat plane which infiltrating into the kidney and excision was done and uh, now she presented with metastasis also so this was a morphology, if you see, uh, with the gelatinous fascia, this section, what, what I was talking earlier, if you see, if you give, this is the ink, you can see, this is the gelatinous fascia, the perinephric fat is will be there, capsule will be there, the tumor was there. 
so when i saw this morphology i was very happy because if you can see in the high power many uh, fibrous sectors and fibrovascular sectors are there cells have clear cytoplasm and uh, these are the cells few cells are elongated also and uh, many cells have eosinophilic to clear cytoplasm so i thought uh, the cl uh, clinician called me i said it looks a very uh, clear cell to me but i said okay let's me do he said you can do i see so i said i i'll do i see and we did cd 10 which was negative ck7 was which was negative and uh, other markers we did vimentin which was negative so again we said if it is a clear cell why we, all the markers are coming negative we re looked into our morphology and we saw some uh, bizarre cells and then we saw some thick thick blood vessels also so could it be a we we did a hmb45 so could it be a angioma lipoma with a epitheloid predominance so hmb45 was positive melanin was positive as ascendant was also focal positive so we labeled this as epitheloid angioma lipoma this was a case some time back when who was new so i thought i wrote as new so these were the cases so <clears throat> so still we are juggling with the hne isc and molecular uh, markers and we our new classification will be uh, no if not now in future it will be molecular driven and uh, basically uh, and in, it will play a major role but uh, still i think at at this moment hne and uh, ic plays a good role in diagnosis of renal cell carcinoma and uh, a key main key to this is proper grossing proper handling of the specimen and uh, what i tell to my pgts is if you do proper grossing your more than half of your reporting is done in the grossing room only so better to know the stage of the tumor and what are the sections if you know you can write down the sections okay these are the sections we have to we have to give again and we where from where we have to give we have to find out where are the areas like neck not giving many sections from the necrotic area try to give sections from different different areas and and for proper staging and you remember the radical specimen are for proper staging so whenever you are reporting you should report as a clinician not just like a pathologist you have to report like a clinician because at the end of the day uh, it the report has implication on the treatment and prognosis of the patient so a lot is happening we asked the question hello ji what's happening so i ended with a lot is happening we have good way to go is our hospital so so yeah. i'm ready to take some yeah, question yeah, yeah. for uh, yeah we have we have some questions and some queries yeah. and we have lot of experts in the panel in the audience who would like to you know give their comments as well yeah. so let me first read out the question in the google chat which is uh, by dr kataria he says is core biopsy recommended in rcc it is not recommended sir usually but uh, in our center we do because of the uh, because of some reasons we do it here okay so it's not recommended what are not the chances the recommendation is not there okay what are the chances of tumor dissemination if we are doing core biopsy sir? I mean, or Kataria's continuation of the same question. We, um, sir, we, um, in, our, in my experience of this uh, in this hospital, I have not seen uh, any dissemination by biopsy, even repeat biopsies also. Usually, it is not there as compared to other organs like testes and all. Okay. So let's wait and see if there any Dr. Sambit Mohanty is there. He would like to make a comment. I would love to. Yes, you can unmute and straight away go ahead. Hi, hi, Doctor Nadim. Hi, Vishal. Hello, how are you? Welcome. I'm good, good. Happy New Year. So, ah, yeah, same to you. Great. great. So, Vishal, great job. I just to add a few things to your thing, like the dissemination by needling or by yeah. doing a core biopsy in renal cell carcinoma it really doesn't happen, and a lot of centers across the world they're doing it. It's a very good procedure because Vishal has already pointed out very clearly in one of his slides that like that, like for low-grade tumors or when you have like jantum granulomatous inflammation or something which is mimicking on imaging and it's diff difficult to differentiate from a low-grade carcinoma. And secondly, uh, renal cell tumors they do not have a very high proliferative index. If you we normally do not do a KI67, 
But if you do it, other than the cases with sarcometer DDF or high grade like a <coughs> CDC or MC kind of categories, you, you get presenting. Then we can see Dr. Mohanty. We can't see him. Just start presenting. Wait, you need to see him. I am actually sitting on the floor. <laughs> doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. <laughs> just start presenting. Just. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah, just go to go go to Google uh, Chrome. Just go to Google Chrome. Press Google Chrome on the taskbar, and yes. you are stop presenting. Just press stop presenting. Yes, yes. On that, yeah, great, yeah. Yes, Doctor Mahanti, comment. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> so that is it. that is a good. I mean, that's a good point. What uh, people ask, but Vishal pointed out very clearly. Normally, uh, the core biopsies are done when the urologist is or the imaging experts are not clear whether we are dealing with a cancer or not. And number two is to differentiate it from sort of a dicey inflammation like jantar granulomatous inflammation, which mimics closely to a cancer. And I have to add a few things there. Like in core biopsy, as Vishal said, in oncocytic neoplasm, most of the time we end up calling it as a as an oncocytic neoplasm. It's difficult to name it. Even if yes. it is diffusely 117 positive, if it is CD 117 diffusely positive, we can say like we are probably in the oncochromo group. But I would yes. prefer to call it as a oncocytic neoplasm because I do not want to lose my patient. Once I say oncocytoma on a core biopsy, the patient is not going to come for follow up, and later on he will come up with a metastasis. So he will come up with a metastasis. So the basic job for the core biopsy is um, not to Call something. I mean, which definitely grading is not the question. The question is, we need what is the next step. So, as a pathologist, like a clinician, we have to think two instances. When we are looking at a resection specimen, we think like we are treating the patient, and when we are looking at the core biopsy, because once we say like there is no cancer, is oncocytoma straightforward, the patient is not going to come come for this. And so, and RCCs are known to have a very rich inflammatory stroma, like lymphocytes and plasma cells and giantoma cells. Sometimes in core biopsy, they give a very deceptive look of a giantoma inflammation. And the more and more coming up in the new WHO and all. So that time also, I'm a little skeptical to call like whether. And another instance is when you have a very cystic change. I mean, you see a uh, one corner of the biopsy has a cyst with some cells, an H and E. And they look very, very inconspicuous in HNE stain. You do a PATS-8 or a CK-7, the cyst is going to light up. So in that case, definitely you are not dealing with a uh, non-neoplastic process. So it's basically a good screening technique, and I I like it. I mean, I like the core biopsy concept. Yes. And regarding the margins in radical, uh, sorry, partial nephrectomy specimen, we do get that from the urologist. But the studies uh, across in the Europe and the US have shown like in, even in India, I asked the urologist if I say the margin is positive, are you going to give me more margin? They said no, because they do a fulguration technique. So by that and it's a round thing, it's a concave thing, uh, sorry, convex yes. thing. So even if you kind of uh, say it is positive, it is not like breast or any other organ. You, they don't give you more thing, and uh, the patient really they do well. Mm -hmm. And recently I had a case which I said like. Uh, Year and a half ago, I said the margin was positive, yeah. and the patient developed some chronic renal condition, and they sent the uh, tissue to me. And there was a, like a scanning and the, all the biopsy-related changes at the margin side of the total effect to me, but there was no tumor, and they did not. The patient did not get any adjuvant treatment for that. So when the surgeon is sending a frozen section, so the mm -hmm. Rakesh will call me. The surgeon will call me and will tell that. Uh, the tumor was huge when they try to cut mm -hmm. uh, the, spare, the the margin. The tumor tends, as you said, the tumor tends to bulge. Yes. So they have to remove the tissue, but as the tumor bulges, there may be a cut. Right. So it is not a margin is positive. So that that is what I am saying. Clinician correlation will should be there, and a communication with the clinician should always be there whenever there is some discrepancy. When you see the tumor mm -hmm. is cut and uh, whatever uh, any discrepancy is there, so that is the key. That's a key, yeah, absolutely. And one thing is, in our setup, like in India and all, we cannot tell every patient to like go for immunostain in RCC. So we end up calling something as unclassifiable RCC. And before we try to name it, it's always better to talk to the clinician. What is the clinical repercussion of that? Whether he, he or she is going to change the treatment of the patient. 
because most of these new evolving entities do not have their specific genomic uh, repertoire and a specific target in them. So in that scenario, it is kind of always good to have a uh, clinician, uh, an interaction with the clinician to yeah. have because in the epiploid AML, uh, our clinician gave them mTOR rapamycin they gave. Okay. And they had skin lesions also at that time. Okay. And uh, responded well to the treatment. Great, great. Yeah, because mTOR inhibitors are kind of, they are FDA approved. Yes. And uh, either the selection of the VHF inhibitor or the mTOR inhibitors. And also, and how do you, your clinician, they do they ask for PDL one for these cases? Renal cells, I mean, aesthetic renal cells? They are asking, they are asking. They are asking, yeah. That's something yeah. very, very upcoming and has a, a lot of papers coming up and a promising value when they're in renal cell. And renal yeah. cell is, some of the renal cells, the low-grade ones are good disease, like the LOTs, low-grade oncocytic tumors. Yes. And um, chromophobe is a good tumor to have with yeah. those it looks. And chromophobe sometimes is very, very tricky. It, you do not get the nuclear, very nuclear halo and the wrinkling all the time. So that is one area. Do you do um, immunostent for all your oncocytomas, even if it is classical? In our, in I know, I know the answer. What you are thinking? But no, no. That. <laughs> in the radical specimen, definitely I I won't do it because Good. I have the specimen pen time. But in biopsy, I am very much uh, skeptical. Yeah, biopsy will definitely do. My question is, you have a um, classical oncocytoma? You do not. I mean, it's like a no-brainer oncocytoma. Will you go for CK7 and CD117? I know you are a geopathologist, so I'm, for that reason I'm asking. <laughs> <laughs> ideally, we should not take any risk. <laughs> yes, I got your answer. I mean, ideally, because this LOT thing is kind of coming up. Where they, yes. I mean, typically oncocytomas have very little CK7 positivity, they're never zero. And CD1 will be brightly positive, but there's an entity coming uh, which is already there, which is CK7 diffuse and CD117 negative. And looks like more or less more like oncocytoma than chromo. And we recently we did a just, huh. just completed our meeting. Yeah. yeah. Only. And many changes I cannot tell now. Many I changes know. Have but that's it. That, but I, I'm oh. glad, like you said, you don't want to take the risk. So I got the answer. I mean, at least we all are, we both are doing the same job. Yes, yes, yes. Great. There is Great. one more Great. question. There is one more yes. question. Yes. Which I would like to take before we go to kidney. That is, uh, we will go to prostate. That is regarding the sampling of the attached adrenal. Yes. Whether the adrenal should be sampled separately or in in continuation with the gerota and the tumor. Like uh, uh, like my case, uh, uh, it was very uh, very much adherent with the tumor only. So better to take uh, if it is adherent, better to take a continuous section because if it is a continuous. Uh, uh, continuous uh, um, involvement of adrenal is there, then it becomes T4. And if it is a separate involvement is there, non-continuous, then it becomes a metastasis M1. So that is very important. So if the, the, the adrenal is uh, very much close, in close proximity and attached with the tumor only, better to take the section with that only. Right. Great. So that was one query. So let We'll move to prostate. Dr. Manthi, hang on. You should be here. Yeah, I'm here. Thank you. Great. Right. It's nice to see you. Can you see my screen now? Yes, yes, please. For Jail. Okay. So, <laughs> my favorite topic. And uh, so, uh, brushing of prostate very peculiarly, it has been done. And uh, again, uh, why we are so much worried about this crossing of prostate and reporting of prostate? Why are we putting our heads? Because as uh, earlier it was thought it is a disease in, from the West. But if you see Indian cancer registries now it is increased from 1.14 to 8.6 percent. So and this is a little bit uh, older, I think one decade older uh, data which I have put. But uh, again, if you see, it is on increase because of more of organization, increase of uh, change in uh, lifestyle and uh, PSA levels have been uh, been checked uh, more uh, um, uh, commonly now. So this, that is why the uh, increase in uh, prostatic carcinoma which we are seeing in Indian population also. And uh, basically this is an exocrine gland which is uh, 
20 grams approximately. So why why it is important to know the anatomy of the uh, prostate? Because of the the prostate have these different zones. The com two components are there: the glandular and the non-glandular component. And the glandular component can uh, have the, this uh, peripheral zone and the central zone and the uh, transition zones are there. Why they are important? Because that transition zone, which is the inner gland, is the site of a BPH nodule, which which uh, uh, causes uh, enlargement of the prostate and which causes the symptoms of urgency and frequency, and uh, because of which we receive a lot of turp uh, samples. And this uh, transition zone cancers generally are there. If there is a cancer, then they are very low grade, and the volume is also low, and they have a good prognosis. However, this peripheral zone, which is the outer one, so have a, which have a clinical significant cancers, and that is why we can use the needle biopsy for getting the samples. So again, what is the problem in this prostate? Why we are breaking our head? Because first is localization of the tumor is very difficult. Second, there may be a small tumor foci which may not be there if uh, we have given small foci and it can not be there in the radical specimen or uh, vanishing tumor syndrome and uh, reporting subjectivity now it has come down but still if you get review section slides you still get 2.2 2 plus 2 or 3 plus 2 reporting so if we see the history of uh, how it is developed the, the original the first one is the original uh, uh, which was there uh, by the Gleason score uh, and then how it has changed so it looks like this uh, now the all the only discrete well found well formed glands are there in pattern 3 pattern 1 and 2 are not to be reported the minimum pattern which you have to report is 3 all the 4 now 4 consists of everything all the glomerulite pattern the fuse cribriform pattern everything has been included in 4 and 5 again it is sheets or uh, covidal necrosis is there and the other things which was added in the last uh, uh, WHO was the prognostic grade grouping which uh, because uh, in the book, the, uh, when patient was given a report of 6 which you, if you see in a, out of 10 it is more than average and patient was asked for active surveillance so patient used to question them Ki when I have a tumor more than an average why should I go for active surveillance I will go for an uh, active treatment rather than so that is why so this great group was uh, made by Dr. Epstein and uh, that so this group, if we if we say the patient is group one and uh, the uh, the worst grade is group five, then the patient says, okay, I am in group one, so I will definitely go for active surveillance, which is less less aggressive, very slow growing and low. So that is why it helped a lot in uh, of the patient because in the group, Dr. Einstein and the group which I have been trained under, they used to give a lot lot of growth after the report. And uh, they used to tell that uh, this is uh, this is a uh, very low grade tumor. So that note has not it has not not been written now. Just they give a low grade tumor, the grade group one. So patient understand okay, I am in a grade lesser group, and I'll go for active surgery. So this is the main history behind making this prognostic grade grouping. So we I when I came back to India, I I validated this uh, WHO new glazing score. Maybe I was little bi biased. But still, uh, I was able to uh, study uh, some um, uh, 143 cases and uh, 8 person, almost uh, approximately 8 person cases were updated uh, in this study. So, before going into the uh, how to grow, uh, grow the specimen, you should always uh, know the stage of the tumor. Like, uh, how it is staged. So, staging of prostatic carcinomas. Uh, starts from T2 only and uh, which is organ confined and then again uh, according to the extension of the tumor uh, T1, uh, T3 and T4 are given that was the major change uh, the major change which occurred from uh, 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 last WHO was earlier it was P T2 as where, where one half more than half was there but now they have removed T2 A, B, C and now they have put only T2 only so if it is organ confined means more than half one lobe involved both lobe involved everything comes in T2 so this is the major change which occurred in 8th uh, edition and rest all were same so 
So, why? What are the peculiarities? Because no, decent score along with PSA level, this is the nice guidelines which we are, which are used in UK, and uh, the clinical scores uh, depend upon the PSA level, decent score, and the uh, uh, stage of the patient. So, these are the uh, patients are risk. Uh, uh, the stratification is there. If patient have a low risk, then again patient will go for a uh, surveillance, and depending upon uh, the level of risk, the patient treatment will be there. Uh, will be given. So again, before going into the grossing, you should know what are the clinical uh, clinical findings uh, which are relevant to the patient, and uh, what is the clinical context and what is the type of specimen. We'll see how, how many specimens are there. So information about the prior biopsy and dissection is important and uh, helps in interpretation of microscopic findings within the appropriate clinical context whether low volume low grade is there and any treatment has been given anti ADT treatment has been given because it may alter the cytology and architecture of both benign and malignant glands and therefore may uh, is alter the significance of grading and this is the most important radiotherapy because <coughs> a patient may undergo radiotherapy so date of starting of the radiotherapy what is the uh, when the day radiotherapy has been stopped? Whether the it's a brachytherapy uh, has been given? What is the date of insertion of the seeds and all? That information is very much required. So, what are the specimens we get in prostate? The biopsies it can be transrectal, transperineal. Uh, the the terps, enucleations or simple uh, prostatectomies, radical prostatectomies and lymph lymph node removals can be the same. So again, biopsies, biopsies mainly for diagnostic diagnosis and getting the score and uh, the grade of the, the prognostic grade and uh, and they are performed when there is an elevated serum PSA levels and they, if there is an abnormal uh, DRE and uh, usually it is performed via 18 gauge needle and it can be transurethral or transperineal. So what are the different kinds of biopsy which we see? It can be a sextant biopsy, it can be an extended biopsy or it can be a saturation biopsy. Sextant biopsy is the widespread uh, biopsies which is used. Uh, this It is sampled bilateral, base, mid gland and apex. The extended biopsy can be used as an initial diagnostic procedure and uh, it, it is uh, demonstrates increased cancer detection rate without increasing morbidity. False rate and negativity rate is approximately uh, 5% as compared to 25% in sextant biopsy. So, and uh, in what is saturation biopsy where there are more than 20 goes. Basically, it is not an initial procedure and when there is a persistent elevated PSA level and we are not, we are finding a negative biopsy, so then it is done, which also include the transition zone. So, again, uh, while handling the biopsies, it's very important to count and document number of codes. Ideally, you if they have separated, they have sent in different containers, you have to give in different cassettes and uh, the usual formalin fixative is used and basically hematoxylin or any uh, dye can be uh, can be put on the tissue core to make it more visible and one to two core section per block to minimize the tissue representation should be thin so again one level more level the tissue may deplete then if you use many cores are then it becomes a, a mix it, uh, the tumor uh, is lost so level 1, 2, 3, as the experts say, 1, 3 and 5 can be used for HNE and unstained levels can be used for the ISC if they are required. Ideally, uh, three sections should be present on each HNE slice to enhance the three step sections as uh, the experts say. And most of the tissue in the block from the superficial, superficial to give should be included in the section. Uh, uh, in our institute, we received this extent by IFC. Uh, so this we have made a form. Uh, it, it gives a tabular form. So we record our gross findings here and we record our tumor histology. So when you are recording it, you some points to <coughs> to write are the what is the histology, where adenocarcinoma, S in or NOS, the modified, I call it because it's this is the modified Gleason score, the modified Gleason score, the prognostic grade group 1 to 5, percentage of tumor in the core is important and percentage of pattern in 3 plus 4 or 4 plus 3 percentage of 4 is also important and LVI PNI. So uh, basically now the concept of global uh, grade is also coming because uh, we leave it to this uh, clinician to find out which is the grade. So basically what we, if there are 12 cores, so basically we can give an average score, uh, final average score and a final uh, average grade which will help 
uh, the clinician rather than just leaving a, uh, to the clinician. So this is how we record our findings. So final score 4 plus 3 and final grade is 3. So per percentage of 4 and percentage of the total tumor is also been given. FNAC and cytology rarely perform uh, and uh, basically uh, with adequates it's cheaper, faster, easier to use. Major drawback, uh, drawback is lack of architecture. So you cannot differentiate between a pin and a patient's uh, grading you cannot give. And uh, touch imprints uh, may be useful in immediate reporting and uh, they may can provide immediate and reliable cytological diagnosis of prostatic carcinoma. Basically because they are rapid and uh, highly suspected cases and abnormal PSA levels are there, then we can use it. So TARP, uh, the transurethral dissection of prostate or subtotal prostatectomies uh, is a surgical choice for BPH and uh, open simple prostatectomies may be performed for bulky BPH and it includes the transitional zone as we discussed earlier and areas around the proximal uh, prostatic urethra. So incident of prostatic cancer encounter is approximately 10% 10, 10 we have also seen incidental cancers which are found in uh, top biopsies and uh, sometimes because ours is a uh, cancer hospital we receive top not for for BPH, we receive mostly for the uh, for the relieving of the symptoms. So we, I tell my PGTs, don't break your head for the recent score and don't try to fit in many blocks. So, so we have to submit up to 12, 12 blocks. But again, it is the institutional policy. Uh, uh, if you have, if you are able to sample the uh, the the top adequately, then accordingly you can give the sample. Uh, and if there is cancer is present then we have to submit the entire uh, tissue for the proper uh, assessment and volume of the tumor. So enucleation and resections, uh, they do not, um, basically these are, <coughs> they don't require prior sectioning and uh, they are generally restricted to large prostate in patients and lower urinary obstructive patients. And uh, a few incisions may, in the biopsies may allow formal fixation and inking is not useful in these cases. Usually they are. Uh, process as a top. So now coming to the radical uh, prostatectomy. So again, as I told you, any large specimen fixation is important. Weigh the weighing of the specimen is important. Orient the specimen, ink it, and serially slice it. And uh, peculiarly, we have to submit it entirely in prostate. So radical prostatectomies are performed after when there is a documented carcinoma on renal biopsies, uh, prostate biopsies, and there are numerous protocols for submitting either ranging for submission entire specimen in whole amount or to limited sampling using, using standard slide. So whatever method you are using, they, we have to evaluate the extent of the carcinoma, grade, stage and the margin status. So you can do entire or you can do in a partial sample in a systemic fashion where you can give the different uh, uh, sections. So again, uh, yeah. Okay, so if you see we, when we receive the total reserve, we usually do get a robotic specimens done by robotic surgery, and uh, so you can either inject the, the with formalin or you can keep it in a uh, jar with one to one is to ten ratio. Then again, orientation is very important. Again, you can put a probe along along the apex, so we can you can identify the apex base of the tumor the anterior bulging part, the posterior flattened part is there and the seminal vesicles will be there. So you have to identify the organs and the proper inking should be proper inking should be done. So you after identifying the apex base uh, to the right lateral, left lateral, anterior, posterior, you can just ink it in different colors. Some many people ink in black only, only one color also. It is the depend upon the institutional protocol. So separate the seminal vesicle, weigh the uh, the tumor, and sign and weight of the prostate. Size is very important because it is uh, inversely proportional to the, to high grade cancer, advanced disease, and greater risk of progression after uh, radical prostatectomies. Therefore, they may be important uh, prognostic variables post operative to predict biochemical progression. So well, how to do it? Now section cut specimen how you cut up? So what, first what you do is the apical margin you just amputate a 4 millimeter thick cone as you see in the first upper figure you just amputate it then lay the section flat on the board 
and cut into left to right half through the urethral orifice. So just bread loaf it. And bread loaf it and then you have to submit it edge embed. Because then the if you see that ink is there above and you have to edge embed the specimen. And then you have to do the serial slicing. If you do a whole mount, you see. So what is the you can see the margins are there very nicely. And you can cut the specimen. Then again the bladder neck also serially slicing. You come to the bladder neck. Again amputate at a 3 millimeter slice. And then include the entire uh, bladder margin and mucosine junction. Bread loaf same like apex in 2 millimeter into and submit at edge. So like this you have to submit. Right and left you can submit it separately also. So this is the edge embed. Seminal vesicle also same, amputate the seminal vesicles and uh, from transversely section from base to each seven near the junction with the prostate. So this is the whole mount section which we cut and uh, this you can see the first section is the uh, apex which is edge embed, amputated and embed edge embed. These are the serial sections and this is the base and these are the seminal vesicles. Again a proper labeling should be done. So we use whole mount, but you can uh, earlier before uh, I think 2017 when we didn't have robotic and mega slides, we were using this four sections you can make, but you have to just level. You can just make it half, you can make it four, six, eight, whatever, how many sections you want, depending upon your own ease. And uh, you, but you have to label it them properly. You have to grade it if you want to, and label it properly. So this is a, the, these are the mega cassettes, mega cassettes we have. So we. And these are in the, it makes our jobs very uh, simple when we have to see 70 80 slides as compared to 5 6 slides. So, these are the key two sections, and you give the apex margin, the serial section, the base, and the seminal vesicles. So, these are the mega slides which we get. You can see clearly we have adjusted these uh, the apex and the base, and the serial slice is there, and better localization of the tumor can be there. So this is how we uh, uh, record our findings like specimen, what are the specimen we have got and uh, then again we see what is the size of the specimen weight and uh, seminal vesicle size and then specimen which how, what are the colors which are in and the specimen is sliced from apex to base and submitted entirely. So these are the findings, those findings uh, and then the final uh, Report is you have to write what are the histological type and no carcinoma as advanced, the modified Gleason score, prognostic grade group, the involvement of the tumor of the prostate, LVI PNI extension, extra prostatic fat extension, whether it is focal, non focal, and if there is a higher grade tumor, you, that also you have to mention, bilateral seminal muscle involved or not, you have to mention, and the margin including the base and apex, you have to mention whether involved or not. So quantification, how to report it? Quantification is done by simple eyeballing. So and uh, uh, you have to just see the serial section, and you can mark it uh, microscopically, and then you can just uh, <coughs> use your marker pens with better uh, marking of this. So extra prostatic in uh, extension, it is basically tumor is going out of the prostate, but it doesn't necessarily, it does not necessarily means that the margin is positive. It is just going, now you can see in the below figure, now ink is there and the tumor is going into the fat. But, uh, and here also, ink is there, but it is going into the fat, but does not go into the, in the margin involvement, is not there. Again, as I told you, that uh, what are the location, which location it is positive, number and focal versus non-focal, you have to mention. Mm -hmm. uh, bladder neck invasion, again, uh, it is defined as neoplastic gland above the level of benign glands in the thick muscle bundle are called as bladder neck invasion. So, and it is a very important uh, uh, factor because it is a significant product of uh, PSA recurrence and, uh, and is considered uh, a category of T3A. And uh, seminal vesicle involvement, again it can be by uh, direct invasion, it is also a, have a progn adverse prognostic factor. But and it can be direct invasion or extra prostatic or involvement uh, along the ejaculatory gut or discontinuous involvement. So, intraprostatic uh, um, uh, uh, seminal vesicle is not considered as a involvement, but however, this uh, you can see seminal vesicle which is extra prostatic that only involvement is uh, included in the definition of involvement. 
So again, margins, as I told you, apex and base are the problematic areas where fat is less. So that is why we give edge embed there. And then again, what are the, uh, it should be entirely submitted and it should be um, mentioned with, with the, how about which are the margins are involved. And negative if the, it is not present as inked, inked margin, positive if too much sense touches the ink margin. But you have to be very careful in telling the margin positivity because uh, by cutting the tumor, may, you may take out the fat also and it can be a false positivity. So definitely you have to just, uh, you have to make sure uh, how, uh, how the tumor cells are reaching the uh, ink may have seeped in to the adjacent tissue where the fat has been removed. So you have to see the entire section and decide uh, accordingly. This is what I was telling. The prostate should not be interpreted as extra prostatic extension. And intraprostatic margins are positive in setting of intraprostatic or capsular incision. Uh, we have seen more than robotic, uh, 100 robotic cases, uh, robotic uh, surgery where they had been done. done. And uh, only I think one case where the surgeon already informed that it is a uh, R2 resection and they have cut through the tumor. It was a very, very bulky tumor which was going into the uh, bladder and all. So usually we get a good good margin and uh, so it, this is not a problem but you should be very much aware of it. Whenever there is a discrepancy, talk with your surgeon. Don't straight away give uh, there is no tumor or there is margin is positivity or like that. So any discrepancy, so that is why I am saying you have to think like a clinician and uh, accordingly if any discrepancy is a talk with your surgeon and treating physician. So margin, what is the length of the positivity, focality and location where, where it is and margin positivity is there in extra prosthetic extension also and uh, what is the location and the decent pattern should be so told. So these are all the points we you should look uh, and, and this is the uh, new uh, the uh, micro photograph uh, which has been made by Dr. Epstein himself. He say, so, uh, he tells that how far uh, in this era of uh, uh, digital pathology, how can we use a schematic diagram of lesions? Uh, uh, so he has made it. This is also available in the his uh, in the Hopkins website. So you can just find out and uh, you can just follow it. You can keep it in your desktop and if you have any problem you can just see it over and different patterns. Now what about ISCs? So mostly I don't use ISCs uh, even if there are some atypical small glands then we can use ISCs and uh, as you can see the most specific one is uh, uh, NKX 3.1 and Prostein. We have done a study on Prostein also and uh, it, has, it is a very good marker and uh, it, it is more specific and it can be expressed uh, unrelated to the decent score. And uh, PSA and uh, prostate and these are all also most sensitive markers. So one point of caution I want to tell to the, all the PGTs is do not upgrade from suspicious outpouching of HGPN based on your positivity of MCAR because MCAR can be positive in high grade pin also. So just only one section you are seeing and MCAR is positive. Don't go that oh this is an carcinoma and do not downgrade a cancer to suspicious or suspicious to benign basis based on the negative uh, negative MCAR staining. So take a message is again clinical details, radiological findings, prior diagnosis and IC if done, localization and size of the tumor, margins and capsular removal and most important here is inking of the specimen. So I have um, I have two interesting cases. One is uh, uh, this is uh, reported by me and my uh, my senior colleague and uh, this is a 60 year male and patient presented with bleeding PR and uh, constipation and he had a circumstantial growth in the rectum and uh, again there was a mass in the rectum which was and, uh, and he had a PSA, raised PSA of uh, uh, 6.4 uh, units and uh, both biopsies from the rectal lesion we thought it is a prostate going into the rectum or rectum going into the prostate so we did biopsies for both. The rectal biopsy was very uh, uh, it was uh, uh, suggestive of uh, adenocarcinoma well to moderately differentiated and uh, uh, but the prostate biopsy showed a lot of inflammation and uh, a lot of uh, 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 these changes were there and uh, then we looked at uh, the higher power these were they were looking not a mixed population but a monotonous population and uh, 
I consulted my senior hematopathologist also regarding for this these cells. So we did AMCAR earlier and it was negative. And uh, P63 highlighted the benign glands. And then uh, CDX2 was also. We thought it could it be just a poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma from rectum. But CDX2 was also known. So basically, these are inflammatory cells, monotonous. So let's go for LC. So LCA was very much uh, diffusely positive in this case. And uh, CD3 was background. 20 was very much positive in this. Other markers were 10. B cell 2, 23 was very nicely positive. And 5 was focally positive. So also was also focally positive. Here was little bit there. So it was given as diagnosis of low grade B, B cell non Hodgkin's lymphoma, favoring a small cell lymphoma. However, the PS first male was showing no atypical cells and uh, bone marrow aspiration biopsy was also no involvement. So, so it can be it accounts for 0.1 percent of all NHLs and 0.09 percent of all prostatic tumors, and age is very broad, <coughs> and symptoms may be same as BPH. And usually, prostate is non-tender and not as hard as a carcinoma. And uh, these lymphoma, uh, these uh, uh, studies have been done. And CLL and mantle cell commonly occur as a secondary involvement. And uh, CLL and SLL occurring as a primary if not reported. So, because generally known to have indolent codes. It's another case of a 50 year old male. And he had, uh, so he had a um, mass, uh, uh, he underwent a uh, urethroplasty in 2015 and despite the urethroplasty symptoms did not, uh, because he had a dis difficulty in micturation. So underwent supra pubic catheterization and uh, he had a, we were habituated to smoking uh, tobacco and consumption of alcohol and uh, PR they could uh, palpate up a prostatic mass. <coughs> So, radiologically, there was a prostatic mass, and uh, then patient underwent a biopsy prostatic lesion, which was incongruous because there were uh, haphazard cells, some spindle cells, like that, which was there. So, radical prostatectomy was done with the resection of the bulbar urethra and bilateral pelvic lymph node dissection. So, this, this was a mass which we received, a large prostatic mass was there, which was around 18 to 7 centimeter. And mass was adherent to pelvic floor muscle, inferiorly endopelvic fascia. These are the OT nodes. And the plane of with rectum, rectum was well maintained. And uh, bilateral lymph nodes were there. So this is the specimen which we received. This is the prostate. This is the bladder. If you see the cut section, bladder looks normal. And this is the prostate. So we in, submitted the entire prostate. And this is the... This is the uh, uh, chenny which we got and uh, same similar morphology there was there in the biopsies also it's very high grade looking like a very high grade bizarre cells are there the round to oval cells are there uh, this is the high power view so we thought it is a spindle cell lymphoplasma maybe a sarcoma high grade maybe a leomyosarcoma uh, or or inflammatory myofibrillus so these were our dds when we started and then we did AMCAR for baseline and then we did SMA. Uh, Caldesmond was totally negative in this case. Myogeny was negative. So other markers which we did is uh, pancytocorotin desmin, uh, CD117, DOG1, which were negative. And expression of the NI1 was intact. So again, we look, relooked our uh, um, the slides and uh, we saw these pendle cells and with vesicular nickel moderate amount of of uh, cytoplasmics to with numerous multinucleate and bizarre forms and mitosis was discerned. We did CD34 which was positive at least tumor cells and uh, these are the tumor cells. PR was positive. AI was also positive. So the IC survey if you see Vimentin, CD34, PR and focally SMA and KI was around 30% and uh, other markers were negative <coughs> and the INA was intact. So we, if you see the chart and uh, it was a non-epithelial prostatic spindle cell lesion and we labeled it as high grade stromal sarcoma of prostate which was rendered. So this is and this is the final report which we gave. Stromal sarcoma high grade, 9 cm tumor with 90% involvement of the prostate and the other findings which were negative. So as soon as we released the report we called a call from the clinician. What is this? 
and uh, so we also searched the literature so we found out this table where uh, they have 15 cases uh, 14 uh, 15 cases were there and uh, what were the treatment uh, adjuvant uh, chemotherapy and radiotherapy was given in this patient and what was the response time and what was the outcome uh, of these uh, patients and uh, we in the tumor board discussion was there so we advised surgery with adjuvant chemo RT so patient underwent a prostatectomy as uh, in 2015 and followed by a six cycle of uh, <coughs> uh, chemotherapy till 2016 uh, March and followed by 50 gray of uh, radiotherapy in 12, 25 fraction for five weeks till uh, uh, August 2016 and uh, if we see that these tumors are uncommon and compromise of 0.7 percent of prostatic tumors and uh, in contrast to stumps, tumor sarcoma tend to affect a slightly younger patient with a range of 25 to 86 and approximately half of the reported cases occur before 50 years and they may arise de novo or may exist uh, in association with the pre-existing on con uh, concurrent stump. So we see, we check the rec recent advances and uh, uh, ISC studies in the present case supported the diagnosis of stroma sarcoma. However, it is reported that role of ISC and other ancillary techniques are limited because of less numbers. And there are no approved molecular tests for this. However, study indicated that overexpression of P53, P16, and MET12 gene mutation may imply a poor prognosis. And uh, 17Q duplication and uh, increased uh, prune to protein expression may show a favorable outcome. So, surgical intervention, chemotherapy, radiotherapy as a treatment modalities in this, and five-year survival is 44. And uh, as no biological parameters such as elevated PSA for monitoring is there so absence of metastasis and clear margins have a positive bearing on long-term survival so patient uh, close attention to the morphological detail in conjunction with IC is a key to make diagnosis in this case and we published this case in Indian Journal of Surgical Oncology in 2017 and uh, with 30 months of follow-up in 2018 uh, patient was now present uh, admitted for anemia because he had uh, HB of 9.2 and uh, definitely the tumor, there was no new tumor at the site of uh, uh, the previous tumor site, tumor bed. But uh, patient developed uh, therapy related, uh, sorry, therapy related myeloid neoplasia. So follow up is required and uh, what I want to give <coughs> this uh, message is that your role does not end just at the diagnosis. So your inputs and all are required because any new diagnosis you give to the clinician, they will ask what to do next. So you, we have to find out what are the things, what are the treatment we have to give and you have to follow it up and patient ultimately develop uh, therapy related myeloid neoplasia after three years of treatment. So that is my time. So. So before ending, I just want to thank you, thank uh, Dr. Nadeem and Dr. Divya Madam to, for giving me this opportunity. I also want to thank my uh, staff, my, my HOD, Dr. Sushila, my Professor Sundram and my colleagues and my PGs uh, who, are, uh, who are attending this. Thank you, sir. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. Uh, before, uh, there is one question and that is from Dr. Rekha Singh. I will read the question as it has been written. ASAP, as soon as possible, sir, please talk about atypical small SNR proliferation. <laughs> please, sir, talk. <laughs> <laughs> I can understand. This is a real, yes. real dicey thing. Yes. Everybody yes. is so much worried about this small SNR proliferation. Tumor or no tumor? Yes, yes. So uh, I, but whenever I, be, this is a very important uh, aspect of reporting of prostate. I usually don't do ISCs on prostate biopsies because ours is a tertiary uh, cancer center. So we have the, uh, we, I will say we have the privilege of getting uh, bad tumors. We don't get early tumors. So, but many a time. Uh, reviewed outside the and very small in percentage we say that it is a typical small listener and we try to do uh, limited biopsy like you can do MCR in P63 and you can see those uh, uh, 
uh, those uh, glands if still they are not problem if their no problem is not solved so what you can do is you just can talk with your clinician there are few glands and then again uh, like uh, psa level is important another clinical staging is important so those things uh, comes into account because uh, it is not uh, absolute that uh, um, in biopsy diagnostic has diagnosis have to be given because uh, as i told practical problems localization is difficult if it is a small tumor it is difficult so that those points you have to take into account so whenever you get a small uh, this focus of these cells try to do this um, epithelial marker and myoepithelial marker you can do if you if that problem is solved okay if not solve talk with your clinician patient will be kept under follow up or repeat biopsy will be done so dr rekha singh is it okay are you happy with the reply uh, there is a comment on the youtube which i would like to read out before dr rekha singh uh, responds which is by dr sai malikarjun sitaram says tissue monoclonal lymphocytosis can occur in prostate without blood involvement yeah that's right mm. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. pure prostate lesion you know yes yes so that is also uh, that is also an entity which has been defined although that's it puts you into a lot of confusion but that also has to be kept in mind yes. in all these monoclonal round cell lesions right dr sambit uh, if you would like to say something dr sambit mohanty do you like to say something Okay, we are not getting him. I think we have. If just let's wait for a minute to see if there's any question on the YouTube. So, yeah, Doctor Rekha has a comment. She says these are similar expression IHCs as adenocarcinomas. No, if they are tumor, then they will have. If they are not, then they can be a pin also. If it's a high grade pin also. So it depends upon the expression of IHC. It does not necessarily. If it is a benign thing, if it is a low-grade pin, benign thing won't be shown. Because AMCAR will be produced by high-grade pin and uh, no carcinoma both. But the myopathy markers have, are the key here. So P63 basically, uh, if you see in the best, there is a pin four marker in which uh, P63 uh, the two markers are uh, high markers. Weight cytokeratin P63 both are used in a cocktail, and AMCAR is pink, and both the myoepithelial my markers are brown. So if you do try to do a cocktail marker like that, or if you do it separately also, you have to find. Right, right. Dr. Mahanti. Thank. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. In in a typical small cell proliferation is usually a problem. Once upon once in a while, we all get it. And what Vishal just said, uh, you have to go for a pin for cocktail. Look at the myopathy literature. If you use only one basal marker, you may miss out. It's better to use a second IMOC. I mean, high molecular cytokeratin and a nucleus stain like P63. So, and here I would give more importance to the basal marker rather than the amacar because amacar can be produced by positive in like fibrotic area, sometimes benign gland and pin and all these things. So if we see like your staining is not like cancer cells, I mean there is lots of basal cell and the volume is low and other cores are negative, so it makes a phone call with your uh, clinician saying it's a low volume cancer, the rest of the cores are negative and probably a repeat biopsy is required. If you after doing the staining, you have one or two or very uh, little this thing. Um, basal cell, but you are seeing some amacar positivity, and these are small glands. I mean, non-pin glands. Pin is a big gland disease. So in that scenario, you also need a phone call because it might have um, unsampled cancer, low-grade cancer somewhere. So either way, a telephone call to the urologist is important unless the stains don't behave. I mean, yes. In that, yes. when your morphology and stains are not helping, better better to give it leave it like that only. Don't break your head on that. And talk with the more talk with the clinician and accordingly he will say okay this is a low grade tumor the better will uh, will follow it up and put in active surveillance if we definitely if it's a high grade tumor or more spreading one will be accordingly. The PSA value is important and usually these regions do not have a very high PSA they have usually a borderline PSA 
so that also helps. And just to add on the prosthetic stromal sarcoma, as and Vishal already mentioned in his slides, there is no magic marker. The markers are typically changing. The typical morphology has, but the cases with high KI67, and I mean they need to be followed up uh, because they tend to develop all this paraneoplastic syndrome or metastasis, and to exclude uh, the true sarcomas of the prostate. I mean the other sarcomas of the prostate. Let's wait and see if there's any more questions or any queries. Paramita uh, uh, Madam wants to say something. Yeah, yeah Paramita, I just saw her name. <laughs> Paramita, please uh, unmute your mic and say something if you have any comment to make. I don't think so that there is any more questions. You, we have thank yous in the in the YouTube channel. Everybody is appreciated. <laughs> yeah, Dr. Kataria, you want to say something? Mm -hmm. Hello, sir. Dr. Sant is my senior from my college and a very good person, my guide also. So, thank you, sir, for uh, attending. Uh, yeah, yes. Yeah, hello, uh, Vishal, how are you? Yes, sir. Fine. It was nice to hear you from uh, for after a long time. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, it was a good date indeed. A good uh, uh, information regarding both kidney as well as the prosthetic biopsy and uh, all the immunostochemical markers, which are uh, important for differentiation of different type of uh, renal tumors. Yes. Uh, one thing that. Uh, I was asking uh, in the previous uh, talk yes, that uh, usually we do not get uh, renal biopsies uh, very frequently for the non-neoplastic and neoplastic uh, lesions. Uh, we usually have uh, renal biopsy from the nephrology department. Yes, medical, medical <coughs> yes. nephrology department. Yes, especially for the global nephritis and all other chronic renal failure. Yes. Uh, usually our surgeons because uh, uh, Renal biopsies uh, we do not receive uh, very frequently. We have very few yes. renal biopsies. Yes. We so, uh, uh, for the publication of paper, we, uh, we have seen many. Not aware uh, all these. Uh, uh, yeah, we have done many studies also, sir, and uh, we have seen also studies uh, where now biopsy uh, biopsies are included for renal because uh, to differentiate clear cell and non-clear cell because treatment protocols when there is a. Um, a very aggressive tumor which has been disseminating tumor so they want to know uh, they want to know whether it is the clear cell or non clear cell and uh, again uh, for non disseminating also they uh, what is uh, they may give if they can give any prior treatment to the before the surgery maybe shrinking of the size and all when there is a big tumor yeah, now real biopsies are coming up for like and, uh, any experience of uh, yeah for few reasons like if it is a, like a yes, non clear cell hybrid morphology that time they want to do and the tumor is already metastatic they want to start some new adjuvant therapy particularly for the eosinophilic ones with hybrid morphology they probably they want to triage out maximum tissue upfront for some genetic markers so that some therapy can be given before the debulking happens or uh, non clear cells one, even if they are organ confined, they usually have a lot of molecular players. They want to check it beforehand and do new adjustments to shrink the size and then go for an effective. And also, Priya has a, uh, Dr. Priya Rao, a good friend of mine, uh, Priya has a study on as kind of ongoing looking at PDL1 expression and the four biopsies. Yes, yes. We are doing, we are doing a PDL1 whenever asked. And mostly in, they are doing in. Uh, when there is a disseminated disease or metastatic... Uh, exactly, metastatic setting. Metastatic yes. setting is already there in the NCCN. Yes, yes. yes. Dr. Paramita would like... Uh, Vishal, one more... Uh, more. Sure, sir. Sir. Yes, sir. Uh, any experience of Hale's uh, colloidal RN to differentiate between uh, oncocytoma and chromophore type? Yes, yes, yes. Huh? Yes, sir. We have, we do, we have done. 
even in I, my first case which i saw was in tata only we have the did the health collateral and it really helps it really helps uh, dr parmito yeah. many centers they do not perform immunostic chemical screening so yes, it yes, is a special screen which can it. it is very helpful not that much yeah. uh, uh, recently yeah. recently one uh, one case was referred from central hospital yes uh, uh, delhi yeah. to us and uh, they were not having any markers so yeah. we try to uh, do some other markers uh, along with the health collider which uh, came very beautifully in the chromosome type of yes. it really helps carcinoma so this uh, it's very nice to hear you from just good Thank you, sir. Dr. Paramita, please. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Vishal, excellent talk. I just had a comment regarding small SNR cell change and, in fact, prostate cancer in general. That what I find useful is using two basal cell markers rather than Amaker, which sometimes gives very wishy-washy staining. I can't really use it very confidently. So, um, two using two basal markers is really helps, like a P sixty three with an HMWCK or CK five six, and that actually prevents over diagnosis of small SNR cell change or um, missing misinterpreting. Um, prostate cancer so um, yeah doctor there are many cases you could better to buy a pin 4 marker uh, where um, as madam said it, it will have p63 hm45 hm not as high molecular weight cytokeratin and uh, mkr this the combination will be there so it will be very good Mkr should never be interpreted in the absence of a basal marker in any scenario even if it is not atypical what parameter said is very correctly Amacar is a very dicey stain, yeah. and unless your morphology is not supporting, Amacar alone is not going to do any magic. Right, yeah. and um, more than pain for, I actually like the stains on different slides because it gives you more levels, so yeah. that helps with prostate. So yeah. I'm not a fan of pain for at all. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, ma'am, for the comment. Yeah. right so is there anything more anybody else would like to make a comment any i don't let me just check up in the you in the youtube no there are none so i think uh, we will we will call it a day yes thank you so much dr vishal for such a wonderful extensive and elaborate presentation and you really really slogged it out you know 200 slides my god <laughs> you uh, you really have some stamina to teach and you well you really taught us so well with with uh, you know highlighting the points which are very important right from the crossing part to the immunohistochemistry and also you know picking it up from case point of view showing us cases where things are applicable so it was a real good you know collection of everything a very nice teaching material and since we are having all this up on the youtube channel for everybody to view so this becomes a very good platform for people to learn thank you so much dr vishal for contributing in the teaching process and i would like to thank all and everybody who were present here dr mohanty dr paramita roy dr kataria and dr dr rekha singh dr sohasni naik and there are so many people on the youtube dr aditya sena gunjan gupta malik arjun sitaram to to name the few and the ones whom i haven't named please don't mind me thank you so much we'll see you soon with dr vishal with part 2 yes so uh, what's happening we are we are waiting lot so that's of, it lot of things are lot happening. of things are happening yeah true and you i am i'm containing myself because uh, the who uh, the work is going to take that to who yeah so <laughs> yeah so i wish you best of luck for that thank you so much for you know taking out time thank you everybody for joining in bye bye good night god bless everybody good night take care bye